<coughs> Higgs picture. So where did I stop? Um, okay, there were various bits and pieces of the Lagrangian that I was taking. Okay, for that. Yeah, I don't know exactly what you mean by that particle is physical. How do you recognize physical particles from the Lagrangian? How do I recognize it? Uh, uh, how do I see that the particle is physical? Okay. Well, uh, mathematically, what does it mean in terms of the Hilbert space, say, that a particle is physical? Well, for us, we know when you have a propagation in a gauge theory, the only thing that will happen in a gauge theory of a particle is what you write down in a non gauge theory is a physical particle, right? Unless you would write something crazy. If I write a Lagrangian which has a kinetic energy and the mass term, that's a physical particle, right? I can't help it. What would happen, right? This is a physical particle. There's no doubt. I go on and I found out that e squared is p squared plus m squared. And then, of course, it's physical particle depends what interaction I write. For example, I write minus lambda over 4 phi to the force. It's a physical particle as long as lambda is positive. So it's enough, not enough to write down the uh, kinetic energy or whatever I need interaction. Interaction should be such that there is a stable ground state so that the particle doesn't fall fall down into the abyss, okay? Then my particle is going to be a physical particle. What could happen in a gauge theory? That the particle properties depend on the gauge, then it won't be a physical particle, okay? So that will be a, for you a way of checking. <coughs> and then, of course, there was this argument of understanding the physics. It's not enough to just see, aha, uh -huh, sort of depends on the gauge because we could make a mistake and maybe then you come and, and analyze it, right? When I had a precisely this situation, then I gauged it, right? So this became D mu. Then I wrote the potential to be the plus sign here so that it's wrong. And then I found out that there was no action, but this was. So the question was whether this was physical. And then I realized that this actually guy gives me a, a longitudinal component of W. When I wrote down the term, I got D mu D <coughs> coupled to A mu. So I got suspicious. Look, it can't even propagate by itself. Then I, I start thinking. Then I realize I can gauge it away. So there is a combination of simple mathematical manifestation, which in this case it, it simply depends on the gauge. Okay? And the second that you have to understand physically that that degree of freedom cannot exist. But okay, maybe you know as we go along, let's try to uh, see if there is. I don't think I can give you a better, more more precise. It seems that I forgot to. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll call in the break. Sorry. Actually, it's good that I did this because it's an important quote. Um, let's go on and think here what is physical, what is. Well, <laughs> we already decided. What did I do here? How did I know that this couldn't be physical? I wrote phi as e to the i g sigma. Then I said this can't be physical, okay? I can see that, why? Because I can perform a gauge transformation, local gauge transformation, which this goes away. This is just a gauge, this is just a phase, this is just a gauge piece, okay? It manifests independence, so it cannot be physical. But, I yes. but, but here it's because you chose the variables, well, the, the gauge... Right, way, so I may be wrong, right. I don't know how to give you a prescription. <laughs> you know, it's like asking me, what is the way to solve the problems? <laughs> I don't think I have that magic. So if you have a general Lagrangian, say yeah, written in a crazy I, I, way, then can you figure out somehow how, what the physics No, I, I'd be scared to give an answer <laughs> to that, but maybe there is. It sounds to me one of the things you know to be sure that you solve the problem right. Okay, that how do you know that? Because it depends which variables you're going to choose. That's why I told you, you know, that there is this beautiful joke if you reach by Weinberg, make sure that you choose your <laughs> variables well, right? It's like, 
someone telling you, make sure that you, you know, choose the right career, make enough money, you know, be successful, right? Many good papers and so on, okay? That's sort of along those lines. I don't have this. I don't think we can have that. But it'd be nice when we do more and more of the examples of you seeing, you know, what is the logic behind that. How would I know, by the way, if I didn't do that, I would find out that this guy has a gauge dependent mass. And I would, if I wanted to produce it, I couldn't. Because there would be a cancellation. Remember between the different components? This guy actually, well, there are three of them, but it doesn't matter because there are three massive gauge fields. So each of them will have this funny timeline component in my whatever gauge I chose. And that would cancel precisely the production of the unphysical guy. So if I choose the variable wrong, at the end, I, I will get the right physics if I don't make a mistake. It should be very hard. Physics cannot depend on which variables I choose. The same way that I was arguing when I chose the vacuum. And then it's easy to see because I have a rotation that relates them. If you were to quantize the own physical field... I do, I do quantize it, I do. It's, it's quantized, it propagates it. The creation and annihilation operators create and annihilate it. There are no particles in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Well, when you write the photo, how do you write the photo? Right? And here we have work with unphysical degrees of freedom. We actually quantize them. But what is nice when you try to produce them, they, they don't want to be produced. And you won't find them around. So in other words, they won't be produced. So I won't be able to use them to see, aha, uh -huh, what do I do now? Okay, you have to produce a particle, okay, to then study its properties. You can produce separately this. I work with all four components, okay, notice. This is the only way, really, to do calculations. Otherwise, it's a mess to work with physical components, okay. So actually, you, 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 you pretend that they are there. And that's convenient, okay? And fortunately, this cancellation is, 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 is fortunately a nice way of checking that we do the right thing. So I will get rid of that. The same way that I decided to take my vacuum in this direction. And what I found, I leave the fermions aside. That was very simple, right? Maybe summarize it here. that there is a Higgs Lagrangian that we call Yukawa. Actually, it's minus in the Lagrangian, and it had a form, H, well, and fermion over V. And then uh, H, F bar F, let's see. F bar F side by side, right? to keep in mind. There are various pieces of the Lagrangian that I write uh, here and there because you know them already by now, okay? We will be <coughs> writing systematically. One important piece is the kinetic energy of this field. This gave me today, what did we find from here? The masses mm -hmm. of the gauge field. And we found out that MW is G over 2V. And then I found out that it's MZ cosine theta w, where tangent theta w is g prime over g. What else did I learn? I learned that w, well, I didn't learn that. I'll, I'll check that now. z I defined. z was cosine theta w a3 minus sine theta w b. A was sine theta w A3 plus cosine theta w B. And of course, there are mu components on each of these three. So there was a question in which case I'm going to get the photon inside, outside the group. Okay, let's try to summarize what I said at the end and maybe go on a little bit. An interesting limit could be when theta w goes to zero. 
G prime. I let I let G prime zero. Then I'm back to SU two group, and it seems that the photon is just B. It's sort of misleading. Remember what I said because that guy is decoupled. Of course, it's massless because in this Lagrangian of the standard model, with the writing pieces, it was D mu phi square, right? There was a uh, sum over the old kinetic energies of fermions. Covariant kinetic energies of the fermions. There were also kinetic energies for gauge fields and their interactions. So of course, there is a massless field here when it doesn't get a mass in the limit at that w to zero, but it's basically decoupled because what happens when g prime is zero, I'm back to that finger model. I'm back to the SU2 thing that you did at the home for the homework, and that all three gauge boards will get the same mass. So in other words, when theta w goes to zero, <coughs> then uh, mz, which is ma3, is equal to mw, which is ma1, which is ma2. W is made out of 1 and 2, which we'll verify in the moment. The other limit of g going to 0, obviously, doesn't make sense. I have assumed here g, non-zero, OK. I could take the limit of large angela by w by g prime going to infinity being very large. But then I don't have a perturbative theory, so it doesn't make sense even to talk about that. I'll make it more clear in a second. Because the important thing from here for us is to check how uh, SI stands for the squawk doublet, lepton doublet, and the right-handed singlet. So let's do separately charged, current charge interaction, charged weak interaction. That means that then I, psi bar, gamma mu, d mu psi is just the, uh, from the covariant derivative that you remember by now, let me not write it, I will have g, t1, sorry, u bar, d bar, l, g, sigma 1, a1 plus sigma 2, A2 over 2. U, the L. <coughs> gamma mu. 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 Am I right? Yes. Right, the covariant derivative, just to remind you, is D mu minus I G T A A mu A minus I G prime Y over 2 B. <coughs> and, uh, and this will immediately produce the W. See what thing? No, charge. Ah, ah, okay. Charge. Charge means that mm -hmm. the gauge boson carry charge. Charge means that the interaction itself takes a particle into a charge different particles, it sort of complements it, we'll see in the moment. So I will do separately neutral interactions, neutral current as we call it, neutral gauge bosons, which is W and C, which is a photon and C. This is the charge one. Charge means that I take only the off diagonal generators. They will obviously change charge. So this is G over two, U bar D bar L. Here it stands for any upper component, maybe up quark or a lepton, I don't care. It's obviously the same interaction. And then I get 0, A1 minus A2, A1 plus I, A2, 0, mu, gamma mu, U, D, L. And this is? G over square root of 2, I will go normalize it. Notice that this combination gives me UL bar 
gamma mu dl, this becomes dl, I call the w mu plus. I have two pieces plus commission conjugate, obviously there will be w minus, where I define w plus minus is, is 1 over square root of 2 a1 minus plus If you already checked, we didn't need the Higgs mechanism to do that. We, when we wrote here the covariant derivative interaction, it was irrelevant how I gave W mass. I gave this interaction. So Glashow had this interaction before Weinberg and Salam. So I did a correct identification to call the W, the first two components, A1 and A2. And why do I use this language? It's always a better language for a charged particle to take a complex combination which has well-defined charge, right? That's why it works with the electron, not the real and imaginary components of the electron. They wouldn't have the, right? You can always write a complex field as real plus imaginary. Always the thing about variables. So this is okay. This is a chuck recurrent. So maybe we can pause immediately how do I reproduce, we've done this before, the weak interactions, effective weak interaction by propagating double. For example, a down quark can become an up quark, emit uh, what, W minus, which can then become an electron, and then a tiny neutrino going up. And this is the celebrate neutron decay. And what is the effective interaction, Hamiltonian or Lagrangian effective? I don't care about the factor y. It will give me g squared over 2. UL bar, gamma mu dl, and then EL bar, gamma nu, nu l, times the propagator of W, mm -hmm. which is, G, I'm not writing factor wise, which is G mu nu, minus Q mu Q nu, over MW square, I'm in the unitary gauge, Q squared minus MW squared. And at very low energies, I get G squared over 8 MW squared U bar gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5 D E bar gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5 new. This is called, this has a name, it's called a Fermi. Effective <coughs> coupling. <coughs> and typically written as G Fermi over square root of 2. So we can use the same convention. So this is very important that I now, this will come later. Sorry? Why is the Why is what? A. Eight. Yes, why factor eight. eight? Why was factor eight? Yeah. Two. Two. Ah. two. And another two. Left ah, okay. to remind you is one plus gamma five. Ah yeah. Over two. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you are. Okay? okay. It's good. Because I know it's four after four and you hopefully had a good lunch. <laughs> hopefully. Or you just had the usual cafeteria, <laughs> I don't know what it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> You may be sleepy then. So notice, you raise these things that you know already in the dream. That G Fermi over square root of 2, this is very important. I can write this E square over 8. There is just that MW. 
sign to the devil. Oh, maybe I'm rushing ahead of myself. It's queer. That we derived last time. Let's let's rederive it. I'm using the fact that E is G sine theta W. Mm. Let's keep this here and let's rederive this. Okay, there was some time ago you may have forgotten. Because what I have to do now, I have to check that the the, the uh, neutral interactions will produce correctly the photon. But we can say even the Z boson, we know the Z boson properties, okay. But I'm gonna predict them, you know, I have this sort of historic <coughs> emphasis to make that all or what we have in the standard model was predicted theoretically, strangely enough. Even the surprises that you I will talk about that arrived late was BP could forgot the predictions that they made. And I will comment on that. Um, I'll erase this. If let me leave this, then this interaction. Let me leave this. Let's just erase this and then do the the neutral one, which is slightly more involved. Okay, we can keep this. You see now, gradually, we are building up the blackboard. Maybe by the end of the day, we'll have this. So B neutral. The advantage of doing the neutral thing, I don't have to write explicitly upper and lower component because the generators are diagonal. I can simply write psi bar, gamma mu, T3, A3 mu, plus Y over 2, V mu, phi. Psi, of course, depends, doublet, singlet, I don't care. It's all hidden in the values of the uh, uh, G, G prime. You agree? Mm -hmm. This I can call the neutral current, Lagrangian. This is the charge current. Now, first thing that I, that I do here, I don't like why. Why don't I like it? Because I don't know what in the world it is. I don't want to memorize it, right? So I use the fact that y over 2 is q minus t3. By now we accepted my conventions, not Hellas of us, right? We are, we are here now <coughs> all agreeing that in the rest of the course, the doublet has hypercharge plus 1, which is just a convention. Mm -hmm. I go have token phi tilde, whatever. And my vacuum is what it is, so this becomes phi bar. Let me drop. Okay, let me write it once more, and then I'll try to be. So this is G T3. Then I write what A3 is. I read there. A3 is sine theta W. You forgive me if I do this for the time being. SW, to have more space. Mm -hmm. S is sine. C is cosine. SW. A. Plus CW. Z. Let's say 3. Plus. Q minus T3. And what is B? It's. C W A minus S W C. V G prime. Thank you. I bar them on you. Mm -hmm. So let's write A first. Where am I here? It's G S W T3. I'm gonna pick up T3 first, minus G prime. Mm 
A actually has two pieces. P3 and then the Q piece with plus sign plus G prime CW Q. This is A. Correct? Mm -hmm. I think so. Plus Z, let's write down and then reflect on it. So Z, what will give me Z? So Z mu will have T3 will be G S G C W. Now there'll be a plus sign. Minus and minus is plus. And Q will go with the minus sign. Minus G prime SW Q. And I'm going to pause. You see, it's all being predicted. <coughs> Once I define my vacuum, my ground state, I have no choice anymore. I have a well defined Lagrangian, right? Once you have a ground state, the physics follows. Notice that this is zero. From here. It had to be. But it shouldn't be surprising. That was a massive, massless state. But I know that the only generator that conserves, that annihilates vacuum, is Q. So therefore I expect A to couple to Q. Because consistently told me, I should have even said, I don't want to compute, I'm lazy. But it's good to see how physical argument agree with computations. So this, what is this? Well, that's called E. Now it's just a matter of calling it. This is this couples correctly to the charge, but the coupling also is called E. So this is the thing that I wrote here. I found out that E is G prime cosine theta W. Well, that's equivalent to G sine theta W. These relations go together. So far, so good. Notice that weak interactions are not weak. E is smaller than G. And the only reason I thought they were weak because W was very, very massive. Why was W massive? Why did it look massive? Because the energies were very low. You always compare the dimension, full number with the dimension, full number. When I go to high energies, I said it many times. We maybe do an explicit sort of verification of that. I should see physics of photons, basically. All of these guys should look like photons. If I go to very high energies, it probably makes no difference whether I use the basis of massive states or the original basis in which they were not physical states, because when you go to very high energies, particles are basically massless. Basic. A good approximation. So what is this? I can take G over CW out. So what I get, notice here, is CW squared. You agree? Here I have a tangent, but I took CW, so I get SW squared. Minus, let me take this as a common factor here, G over cosine theta W. G prime is a tangent, but cosine W is less, so I get SW squared Q. T3. Yes. So in summary, maybe I should keep this. Let's see how well I can move. At least until the break. Okay, so let's try to be so the motor current. 
is psi bar gamma mu. Okay, let's write like this. A mu E psi bar gamma mu Q psi. I can call it electromagnetic if you wish to be more clear. There is no other chart to talk about. Anyway. That's the photon and the z -bot. Remember how Glashow, what he had to argue. I believe there is a photon, he says. Everybody tells me there is a photon. Then I predict you the z boson just from the structure. We did much better. He had a problem with the masses. He could put them by hand. But he would never find the relation between W and Z masses. This is another profound impact consequence prediction of the heat mechanism that these masses are related. Plus Z mu, which the coupling of Z mu is called G over cosine theta W. I've just normalized it in that. So it's a name, Z mu, psi bar, gamma mu, T3, minus Q sine squared theta W. Five. By the way, some people you will find out call this QZ. Why not? It's some charge looking thing. And to some degree, it's just like electromagnetic charge. For example, when the guy is a singlet, it's just a charge. Okay. There is some overall coefficient, but that, that, that's not a structure. And that coefficient I can anyway, I could have taken out this uh, in the end. We just have the overall thing. <coughs> these, are, these are universal interactions, right, in which the the strengths that's a beauty of gate series, okay, is universal in what determines the specific interaction is a quantum number of a particle. All you have to know the quantum number of particles, the representation of that particle, where it lives in your group space. So it will be the same if you take some big group. You will just have to end if you a guy who lives in that particular corner and you will know how it couples. Okay. This is the Nota car. This enabled me to make this particular prediction. So I knew what MW sine theta W was immediately. Okay. As soon as this was written down, you knew that MW was, sorry, MW sine theta W. Predict it immediately. If you put the numbers, you get roughly 40 GeV. And if sine theta w is a half, which is a good approximation, I will predict mw, ATGV. Well, this number is not really 40, because sine theta w is not precisely a half. But I, I've checked it. You will see in the notes I sent you. I'm lazy. I hate to use. But I'm not only that I'm lazy. I hate to use calculators. <coughs> the problem with the, the computer. I cannot use a computer. I mean to compute. I can use it for. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Many years ago, with my colleague Marciano at Brookhaven, we did some two loop predictions of supersymmetric grand unification. There was a lot of work, months of work. Then you had to put the numbers. And I found out that he was also a computer idiot. Like me, that was very strange to find uh, someone else who was had a fear, a phobia. You know, in the US they have courses which they call physics for poets. So how do you define a poet? Well, the best definition, the people, they have computer phobia in the old <laughs> days. They didn't want to use a computer, you know, so they look like poet. So we decided we won't get help, you know, there were postdocs there. We could have asked, you know, in 10 minutes, we got the number. So we're going to use the calculators. I didn't even notice that my calculator had a memory. 
And there were, you know, two rookies, double hockey right there. It was a disaster. At some point, my little daughter was doing all of this. <laughs> very fun, okay. So since I hate to do that, I took Sunday W to, to check the ZDK bits. And I got a very good uh, thing, because all the formulas get simple if you take sine squared W equal a quarter. For example, electron has only an axial coupling. Go back to your notes and check, or check my notes, okay. And I got uh, an agreement better than 1%. Than so let's, let's often write it like this. What we didn't know was sine theta w, what they didn't know. And I can say we, I was just there, so like you guys now. Well, check this, how do I determine sine theta w? I can't determine from here because all I have is the overall strength, but I can look at the neutral current interaction. I look at different processes, the overall thing will cancel. Once again, it depends on theta w. I don't care if I took a, a branching ratio, so decays, scatterings, I will be able to identify theta w. It took very little time. There was an interesting historic thing that may be good to remember. If you go back to 1980, Sine squared theta w was claimed to be 2.0. I write this number. Who cares what happened in 1980? You were not born. <laughs> well, in those days, we used to worry about unification. It was the beginning of understanding of unification of coupling. So then these numbers were very important, OK? And I'll come back to the end of the course, I'm going to tell you how important this number was. So check the unification, okay. Unification means, okay, I can always wet your mouth, that you believe that eventually complex unify. And you have a, if you have a theory based on a single gauge group, imagine that the world is really based on SU5. Imagine. Then the couplings will be the same at that scale where SU5 is. A, but then you have to check that they really unify. So you have to know the value of a coupling. So you have to know theta w. Because you see, I know E, say, then I have to check the G. I get, okay, well, that's, where is it? That's theta w. So it turns out this number is not just phenomenology, it's important for physics beyond the sun and moon. Okay. But I don't want to rush ahead. With the lab, everything was clear. You could do clean experiments. You had a factor with WZ. You can define theta W even if you wish. So this relation, now it's up to you to define it. You can define it here, or you can define it here. If you define it here, then you predict this. If you define it here, then you predict this. You know, it's a question, OK? But you will measure nicely and cleanly. And when the dust settled, sine squared theta W emerged with better than 1%, 0, 2, 3, 1. Three decimal. This is a great success of the standard model. But it's almost 30 degrees. It's almost a quarter. Um, okay, when do you like a break now? In a few minutes? In we go another five minutes, let's say five, ten minutes. I finish the first part. And then we take a break. Mm. Okay. okay. And make sure you ask questions now, if there is some question. Because when you come afterwards, if there is something that maybe has not been clear. So if, what I want to emphasize is that the weak interaction physics, forget you cover couplings, which have to do with the Higgs, but the weak interaction physics has only one parameter, standard model. That's theta w. If you give me theta w, I can then do everything. Look, it's here. Because we knew E, okay, that's what I mean. The only new parameter that entered in the electronic physics. Okay. And after the normalization, theta W get some corrections. Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. For example, for example, look at this relation. This is called the row parameter. The row parameter is defined as uh, mz 
I can define it like this, cosine theta w over mw. It's often defined as a square. So let me write it as a square. This row parameter is 1. Yes. Will it stay 1? Mm. <laughs> this is sort of... Mm. As if no, he says no, he knows. Well, I saw then it in, in the exam. Right, so what was the indecision exam? Yes, they just said prove it. <laughs> Sorry, they said? Prove it. Prove this? Yes. In a case equal to one. Uh. In the CIS exam? Yeah. In March? No. Uh, Did it March? Yes, in March. Yes, in March. Yes, in March. A previous year, mm. not this year. Ah, not this year. Yeah. You're saying in the yeah. summer of the. Yeah. Ah, in the yeah. summer it's okay, but not in March. Mm. That will be a no-no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't want to test knowledge. You want to test people's ability to do yeah. things. How can you ask a question before, for example, the students here know the standard model a bit? Okay, you can't prove that unless. No, but I said this is one obviously, but I said will it stay one? You said no. Because yeah. you're saying something more. The CIS exam was to prove that this was one uh, at the three level. When I do the loops, yes. there is a question and maybe we leave the answer for after the break, but it's a fundamental question. Do you expect corrections here or not? Because of the vertices, no? Because of the propagator? No. Well, where did this relation? So let's pause for a second. We, we are now about finished. We'll... Uh, Maybe not the race. Where did this relation come from? Look at this relation. This relation came from MA1 equal MA2 equal MA3. Where did this relation come from? In the limit that w is going to zero. Mm -hmm. Where does the relation come from? We commented on that the potential that I write down is actually more symmetric. The standard model potential, the symmetry, or let's write the group symmetry of the potential of the standard model is not SU2 cross U1. It's bigger. It's SO4. Because why the famous doublet? It's actually a quartet of SO4. There are four fields there. Why? Because the potential depends only on phi dagger phi. So it has this extra symmetry, which gets broken to SO3, you know that. Yes. By the way, when you did this factor example, just if I ask you SON, you would say immediately gets broken to SON minus SON 1. Minus you one. will choose a wave in one direction, and then what remains yes. is just 1 and minus 1 <coughs> symmetry. So, and by the way, this fits because I have six generators here. And I have three generators here. Mm -hmm. So that means I broke three. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely the number of massive gauge fields and mm -hmm. a massive of, of those G fields that disappeared, OK? So I thought that SU2 cross U1 was broken down to U1, which is correct as a gauge symmetry, OK, through so phi 0. But in terms of the potential, actually, SO4 was broken down to SO3. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing when the counting is done. We get the mm -hmm. same prediction of three massive gauge fields or three Eaton Goldstone bosons. Mm -hmm. We call him would have been Goldstone boson. If I didn't gauge, they would be really Goldstone boson or would be Goldstone boson. So that means that at the end of the day, there is a protective symmetry. That's so sweet. In the potential. But the Lagrangian, the covariant derivatives and so on, they don't have this extra symmetry, okay? Because covariant derivatives have the symmetry. I decide what is the symmetry, the gauge symmetry. That you say I want this covariant derivative, I want this transformation property, that cannot fail. What can fail is the symmetry which is global. The symmetry of the potential, there may be more. You've got to be careful. The second problem of the homework is precisely that. Maybe more. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
So when I ask you, do you expect here contribution, the answer is yes, because the rest of the Lagrangian doesn't know that there is an SO3 symmetry. I will try to say a few words, a bit more about the symmetry, okay, what I can do in the next part of the lecture. Just that somehow I, 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 I took myself there. I'm never sure how much I want to speak about this symmetry. This is called custodial symmetry. It's like a custodian, it protects the, the masses of the gauge field. So, I think the best is we take a break now. And what do we want? Five minutes, ten minutes? For me, it's the same. Or 13 minutes. And then come back. I don't know. You tell me. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, roughly. Okay. Five. I'm going to five. You give me the pause. Ah. Oh, this is the pause. Good. Yes. Good. Good. So let's let's stop. Let's uh, let's not move on. Let's pause here. I'll probably say more than I was going to say before. It's Friday afternoon, and it's not the time to to learn a lot of new. It's a good time to sort of solidify what we are learning. So let's let's uh, let's emphasize this point. Of the predictions, you know, you, you have a beautiful theory. When you make well-defined predictions, they don't depend on the definitions of your couplings and so on. Okay, I define whatever I do here. This is predicted. If I can measure this, this, and this, and I have ways of measuring. I measure this with interactions. I measure this as a pole of the particle, right? I measure this. Okay, these are well-measured numbers. So I go on and, and say, uh -huh, is this one or not? I have to do the loops. Now, when do you expect a, a, a relation to remain valid? If there is a symmetry responsible for the relation in your Lagrangian, it will remain valid. Mm -hmm. But the whole Lagrangian should be invariant under that symmetry, right? And we know that in the standard model, only the potential has this extra symmetry. Mm -hmm. So let's think of the possible contributions and how they could come about. I don't need, what is it that I don't need? Like, these are just numbers, so let's erase the numbers that are not so crucial to us. Let's pause here. So, when I look at the W and Z, for example, if I think of coupling to the Higgs, well, that has that symmetry, the potential. That's how I derived the relationship. I got it from covariant derivative, which is coupling of W to the Higgs. What else is there in the theory? Fermions. Fermions. So, in other words, there will be loops for example, if I look at the W wave function, W propagator, yes. W polarization tensor, there's going to be a loop, and I will only outline here, okay, and details we will leave for later. I'm thinking maybe that this will be a calculation worth doing. With a little, with a little help of mine, you could do that. I'll try to explain why you could do that. So I have a W polarization tensor. What will contribute? Well, the loop of some up quark, and the uh, bottom quark. I'm speaking of top and bottom now. I have to go to three generations. You will see that it depends on the mass. Mm -hmm. If I want to correct a dimension full quantity, it's going to know about the mass of the propagating particle by definition, okay? So the heavier particle, the better for me. There will be more effect. Mm -hmm. But if you wish, let me write like this. Any <coughs> up and down will contribute. And I want to emphasize here the culprit. There is also the Z. How will the Z look like? U U bar. Very good. Thank you. The U U bar. There will be also the D bar. They are diagonal. I know their quantum numbers. I know how they propagate. Okay, so I can sit down and do the calculation. These diagrams are infinite, notice, by power counting. After all, I have only two propagators. Well, there is a mass here. It will go through the mass. Even if it goes through the mass. Okay, so in other words, it looks like this. K slash plus M. K squared minus M squared. Let's look at the, uh, this is, say, ups. Uh, up. 
then there will be k slash plus, it's not k actually, it's a combination plus mb k squared minus mb squared. Even this piece, even if I go through the mass, if I imagine, it's still logarithmically divergent. Notice d4k, k squared, k squared. There is a divergence and it's truly divergent. And in field theory, what you have to learn is this normalization procedure and so on. But fortunately here, the quantity I'm computing was a number. There is nothing to renormalize. Therefore, if I'm right, and I think this is worth checking, then the cancellation should cancel in a completely non-trivial manner. There is nothing to absorb this infinity. This will be infinite, this will be infinite, and there will be, there will be three diagrams, and this will be infinite. But the difference, or the sum, or whatever, you know, when I compute the row, that's going to be finite. And so I'll just hide the result. It's a loop effect, so it's going to be W alpha V over what? Some 4 pi, I don't know, something there. What do I expect here? Uh, you see, why do I expect the result to be non-vanishing? Because this is coming from the Lagrangian, which has no extra symmetry. There is no extra symmetry. It was just an accident in the potential. We call this accidental global symmetry of the potential. Okay. <coughs> What do you expect here? Lambda Without doing a calculation. Lambda squared plus lambda over squared? No, no cutoff will disappear. Cut no lambda squared. This is a finite quantity. The cutoff must disappear. Uh, the, 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 what you see, uh, let, me, let, me, let me summarize the great work of Ed Hoff, the people that follow it, in one phrase. When the dust settles, when you compute your physical quantities, cutoff must disappear. Mm. Simply. In the limit, limit cut of going to infinity, okay, there should be no contribution. Well, you see, not only that I have to break the accidental symmetry in order to get this result to be non vanishing I have to break SU2. If I don't break SU2, there is no effect that we correct the masses, which are zero anyway, okay? Each of these contributions will be zero. When SU2 is a good symmetry, the gauge bosons are massless, right? The, the mass is emerged from the breaking. Okay, in other words, what enter here must be a measure of the breaking of SU2. And obviously, what is the, what is the, think of it, what do you have in the doublet? You have up and quark and down quark. Mm -hmm. What is the measure? of the breaking of the SU2 symmetry. You know, these are words, the breaking of symmetry. Mass. Well, it's the mass difference between these guys. And it's not surprising that it's quadratic because you are correcting a, 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 a m squared. So what you get is mt squared minus mv squared, roughly over mw squared. You get something, it may be a little more complicated what I wrote here. You get something that should vanish when mv is equal to m top. This is why I said that bottom and top will contribute most. And actually, it's not trivial. This contribution is, is important because top is heavier. Forget this, this is small. But top is heavier than the bottom. Therefore, this is an effect which may be of the order of few percent. That we measure. So what is beautiful in the standard model, the agreement of rho with the measured quantities improved when you do the... Everything got improved by doing loops. In particular, this calculable relation. Okay, so let's. And I have a question. Yes, please. What exactly is this row? I mean. What is what? Row, row, row. Row is this? The ratio of mz cosine to the w over mw. I, I, I just call just it row. Right, just call it. Sorry. Okay. This is better. But it can be just a name. But this was how theta w was defined, right? No, you can define it like that. Then and I can define it here. I can define it here. No, it depends how I define it. Okay, now, but if we define theta w like that, then it should always be one, right? Bro? If I define it to a loop order like that, okay. But if I define it at three levels of <coughs> calculation, then I can go on and compute. 
So let me define theta w if you wish at three level. Or if you wish, if you wish, this doesn't get a contribution which is proportional to uh, to the top fork mass. But what gets it, the thing that is sensitive to the mass square is the mass square is a kind of dimension full quantity which is sensitive. Okay, so that does get corrected. Okay, so I can define it at the three level this way. It will be calculable. Mm. Kind of similar Sorry. to the magnetic moment. Rho? Yes, in the sense that. Something it's, it's just a number, so the... Yeah, it's the way you did in QED when you compare the corrections to the anomalous magnetic moment, okay, which are well-defined finite quantities, okay. So the thing is now to do two loops and three loops and so on, and hopefully one day fail, right? You know when you come to QED, at the fifth loop, for sure, weak interactions become important, okay? You cannot neglect them. Their effects are smaller at low energies. For the diagram where we have the W and the loop in the middle, can we actually have a top and bottom quarks? I mean, mm -hmm. you mean this diagram? Yes. Sorry, no, which? The, yes, exactly. With W yeah. and top and yes, top and bottom. This is big. This mm -hmm. is the diagram. Exactly. I mean, isn't the top heavier than the W? Yes, but it's an option. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's option. It's option. Uh, ah. Well, just like the weak interactions we are <laughs> to ask, think of the neutron decay. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I go through W, w that's even more manifest. Okay, we have. I can imagine. I can imagine this process. Look at this. <coughs> I can just imagine that there is a particle. Let me call it X, which is such that it has charge four thirds. Let me imagine for fun. Imagine that it has four thirds, and it carries color. Just to appreciate. Then you, I could have a diagram, two up quark enter. You agree? Yes. And what I can get out, let's just try to think. I don't want to get two up, whatever. I can get, well, I can get something out. So I can get a positron here and anti-down quark. You agree? It's like having, if you wish. You know, if I want to follow the line, I would write this UC going up. <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah. No, don't get confused when I have break down the line. Okay, it's a crazy imagine, 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 imagine it. It's a boson. You know they call the Z boson the Z boson. Okay, Weinberg says we were hoping this is going to be the last messenger. <laughs> Actually, it was it was a pity. Okay, <laughs> because I can imagine this guy. Notice what this would do if 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 I do something like this. Okay. Please relax a small digression that I like to do. It's Friday afternoon, even more important to have these digressions. What would this do to me? I could make quarks become leptons, if such a guy existed. Mm -hmm. It would have to carry color. You see color couples here, yes. color couples here. Mm -hmm. He'd be a crazy guy. What would I do? He would make proton become yeah. unstable. Look at this. Take this. So you see going out is, let me, let me put it here. Maybe it's better. <laughs> Just to appreciate, okay? It seems unrelated to the question. You see going out, that's equivalent to you coming in. You, you. Imagine that D is watching this. Says, says my God, it's a crazy thing. I got to see what happens, okay? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is this? This is called? Proton. It's called a proton. <laughs> What do I get here? I get the positron. And, uh, and these two guys, I D coming in, I this is called pi zero. I see. So I just created a diagram for pi plus plus, pi zero plus C plus. Actually, the beauty of grand unification, you can imagine the excitement of George and Glacial when they wrote the SU5 theory, <coughs> the particular night, okay, when they claimed. But Georgia claims he invented S10 at the same time. You would produce this immediately. You actually predict that such crazy guy exists, and they are so heavy. Even they contribute. If they should give proton decay, their mass has to be, this is crazy, about 10 to the 16 GV. From which constraint? It's not as big as planet. Oh, this is if it's lighter than this, yeah. okay? Uh, then proton will simply decay too slow. Remember that proton lifetime, you told me you knew, yes. is bigger than 10 to the 34 years. Yes. You appreciate this. Yes. What is the muon lifetime? 
Look how long this is to appreciate that. 2.2 microseconds. 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Yes. Now, proton is a little heavier than the muon. Mm -hmm. But you would expect it to decay with the same speed, more or less. There is something crazy. This guy wants to live so long that obviously the new messenger of that force, whoever she is, has to be obese, not just heavy. Okay? <laughs> you know, I got a lifetime, which is how much longer? This is 10 to the 42 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> 10 to the 48 times slower. Okay? Yes. It goes as the fourth power. I don't know if you remember, this goes as the fourth power of the messages. We'll, we'll talk about it at the end of the course, okay? I have to, but I'm preparing this, okay? Even these particles, you see, virtually everybody contributes, okay? This is very important. In other words, when I speak of the standard model, there may be, you know, as we speak, there may be incredibly exciting processes taking place, and our task is try to detect them, okay? So, they, when they noticed this, they immediately did the back on the Ezelov calculation and they did it right. They said MX has to be heavier than 10 to the 15 G. They said, <coughs> this was 1974. Six months later, it was Georgia and Glashow. The same Georgia, Helen Quinn, one of the rare women in that era, and Weinberg, the same Weinberg, actually computed MX, this is the beauty of grand unification, by checking the unification of couplings, they actually, and predicted it to be around this range. Actually, they predicted it to be 10 to the 15. And as Goldhaber puts it nicely, everybody rushed underground. When this was seen, the world went crazy, ever. In India, in Japan, in Europe, in US, Experimentalists, you know, got well dressed and <laughs> underground and started looking for proto decay. Okay, there has been a number of experiments, and unfortunately, we didn't see it. Okay, <coughs> I have a deep regret. I was hoping, I still hope, that this will be seen eventually. However, we don't have at our disposal. If standard model is a good theory, there is no X boson, and protons should never. I remember the toast that Paul Haber made in a conference. Let proton live forever. <laughs> <laughs> but if it is the case, let it do it in my hands. <laughs> he was one of these experiments. Okay, Maurice Goldhaber was with Rhinus, one of the people that created a beautiful field of, of neutrino detectors. These are people who decided in the 50s to look for proton decay. They said, why don't we try to improve these limits? It was very funny, because proton lives so long, people decided there must be a reason for that. If there is a reason, there must be some symmetry. Well, that symmetry is a barrier number. So they postulated a barrier number. They said, barrier number is a good symmetry. I have to tell this anecdote. So when Goldhaber and Reimers wanted to look for proton decay, people responsible for money told them, well, proton is stable. I mentioned this before. He says, how do you know that? Well, barrier number is a good symmetry. But they said, but how do you know the barrier number is a good symmetry? Well, proton lives so long, you yourself knew <laughs> the limit. There was a limit of 10 to the 18 years. But Goldhaber says, but this is what I want to check. They say, but how can you check it? It's <laughs> <laughs> and this is a mistake that is very, very, very common to make. When I tell people this story, we used to discuss this a lot at Brookhaven with him, and he has a nice interview I can find for you, where he's worried about the way we are taught that the symmetries became so powerful tool and so useful to us that to postulate a symmetry to explain a phenomenon, and then you forget that you postulate a symmetry, and you take that as a prediction. That can never be. Physics comes first. So if tomorrow I see proton decay, say, okay, barrier number is almost a good symmetry. Mm -hmm. Same thing as photon mass. Whatever it is, we have to keep measuring, because there may be a surprise, a Lorentz symmetry, whatever it is. We can't use the symmetry argument to make a prediction. That's eating your own tail. 
and you tell people this and they love it, and then they come and give you a seminar that they have a Z2 symmetry, so that the new particle they have, call it a dark matter particle, cannot decay because of that symmetry. They say, I have a prediction. You understand that this is a lousy argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not a prediction. <laughs> this is just an assumption. Yes, okay. no. That's not a prediction. I'll, I'll try to be more specific why I call predictions of the standard model predictions and not assumptions. Anyway. Let's say a few words. I already told you how you would look at the departures from the symmetry. But what is this symmetry, the Cousolia symmetry, okay? So once again, we have a potential, which is lambda, phi dagger phi minus v square over 2 square. And obviously, if I write phi as phi 1 plus i phi 2, phi 3 plus i phi 4, <coughs> I can also write it as phi 1. I could write it like this now. I can organize it any which way I want, right? This potential, all I meant is this potential is sum of phi i squared. That you noticed, okay? And this has an SO4 symmetry. Now, what is an SO4 symmetry? <coughs> the real? Yeah. Rotations in four dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. So how many generators? Six. Uh, six. Four six. times three over two is six generators. What is the rank? What was the rank? Number of cartons. Uh, three. 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 Uh, no. oh, wait, wait. Let's try again. One. <laughs> <laughs> what is the rank of S or three? One. One. Is that the number of cartons? Yes. 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 What is the rank of SU2? What is the rank of SU2? One. What is the rank of SU3? One more. You increase it by one. Okay. <coughs> that's, a, that's a rule that it's easy. So the rank of SU6 is actually two. You could easily prove that by looking at the commutation nations of SU4. But actually, there is a group which has this many generators, the rank, which is SU2 cross SU2. Uh -huh. And they should be isomorphic. Let me show you that it is. I'm working with a doublet, but I could also introduce the field. By the way, if there is a doublet, there is also phi tilde. Not just phi, right? There are both of them. It's like saying there is phi and phi star. Phi tilde is just phi star. Mm. But I had to sort of multiply it by this sigma 2 to make it well behaved. Let me introduce this field. It seems stupid to do it, but let me still introduce this thing. Phi tilde phi, a matrix. Let me be more clear. How does phi look like? It looks like phi plus phi zero. <coughs> Why? When I wrote Q is T3 plus Y over 2, what are the charges of the, it's one half, mm -hmm. zero, zero minus a half. This is T3. What is the hypercharge for the Higgs my conventions? Mm. Which you accepted. You have no choice. One half, it's one. One, one. one zero, zero, one. And this is one, zero. Mm. These are the values of the charges in a doublet. Mm. Remember, anyway, you don't have to do the calculation. The upper guy has to have one unit more. That's the difference of T3. Y is always the same. Mm. Y is Y the same because it's orthogonal to SU2. A direct product. So this is phi plus phi zero. Can you tell me quickly what is phi tilde? Phi Without phi me writing, phi it's phi i sigma two phi star. Phi zero phi minus. Phi zero phi minus. Phi zero phi minus. No, this will go up. Yes, phi zero phi minus. Phi minus. Ah, sorry. But that's really phi zero star, remember, yes. because I have to yes, make yes, it star. Yes. Ah, and yes. there is a minus sign. Yes. Phi minus. Ah, okay. Minus phi minus. 
if I take a plus sign here, well, it's up to me. I took plus sign here, so it's minus here. I can put it anywhere. Well. So you are saying, why are you bugging us with this stupid matrix? I, I would feel like, like that. <laughs> why? Notice the following. Let's calculate. What is sigma dagger then? This is not a Hermitian matrix. What is sigma dagger? Help me not make a mistake. This is phi zero. Phi zero star. Mm -hmm. <coughs> minus phi plus. Mm -hmm. Phi minus. A bit, a bit different. What is sigma sigma dagger? Let's compute it. You're with me? Mm -hmm. It's late, you're tired, but you're with me. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's compute sigma sigma dagger. What do I get? I get phi zero square. Uh -huh. Phi plus phi plus phi. I don't like what I wrote. Shouldn't the diagonal be the same? No, it's okay. I like what I wrote. Phi plus phi plus phi. Very good, thank you. One two element. This uh -huh. times this. Minus phi not star phi dagger. Minus phi zero star phi plus plus phi star phi zero star. Which is called zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same way you would see that this is zero. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And this again it will be the same as this. Well, yeah. If well, if I don't get well, it, I, 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 I we go home. Yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> I'm tired, I don't know about you guys. I stayed up late last night. You know, it's easy to wake up for your lecturing. I know this is interesting thing when you lecture, you know. If you had a sleepless night, then afterwards you just I went home and get a little rest, okay, because but not in yeah. time you have lunch and whatever. Five zero square plus five plus four minus. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's actually a unit matrix. Mm -hmm. I'm going to erase it. So, what is trace of sigma sigma dagger? Two. Two, two times two. Two times. What is this? Well, let me write this. 5 plus 5. Notice that 5 plus 5 is 5. Let me find some space. 5 0 squared plus 5 plus 5 minus. So the trace of sigma sigma dagger is twice. So the invariant that I wrote, this has an s symmetry, right? Mm -hmm. But notice that now I can write that sigma transforms like this, ul, sigma ur, dagger. Yes. This is a symmetry of trace sigma sigma dagger, because sigma dagger transforms as ur, sigma dagger, ul. Therefore trace sigma sigma dagger mm -hmm. yes. is invariant. This is how I see immediately. You can see the way you saw it anyway. You told me it's SO4, there are four real components. I give you a, a more useful and more elegant and at first glance a stupid way and more complicated actually, but rather useful because I, what looked like SO4, it's actually SU2 times SU2. SU2, SU2, okay? These are unitary two times two rotations I can perform. That's a symmetry. Let's say if you wish, I've just proved that SO4 is equal to SU2 plus SU2 in a different manner. You can look at the algebra and look, play with the generators, you'll get the same result, okay? Mm -hmm. Now why? This is the SU2L, this is gauge. The symmetry I said of the standard model is SU2 plus 1, the gauge symmetry. <coughs> B 
the global symmetry of the potential actually is SU2L times SU2R. The U1 hypercharge lives here, inside. But I'm gauging only a part of it. That's why the whole Lagrangian will never have the symmetry in SU2 plus SU2 because the only U1 is gauged, okay? Mm. So the point is that At the tree level, in my potential, I have an extra global symmetry. This is global. See, this is gauged. This is global. I didn't gauge that. I just gauged the U1 subgroup, which lives inside the C2R. Okay. And this is why I know that when I do the loops, this relation has to be changed. Because the Lagrangian has only this. But the relation that I got, that the masses are the same, why did I get it, by the way? Okay, sorry. Oh, I'm brushing ahead of myself. Now here is an important, very important thing. Look at, look at sigma zero. How does sigma zero look like? <coughs> it's V times unit. Hmm? Why? Phi zero is V. How did I find my vacuum? Phi zero was zero V. Mm -hmm. Equivalently, if you wish, the phi, the neutral component is equal to V. And I'm taking it real. Why am I taking it real, by the way? I was taking it real all the time. What gives me the right to take it real? Mm. Even even Pardon. even just as you told, if you first I use remember the argument a doublet you can always by an SU2 transformation take in one component. You can always do that. But then there is still more symmetry, E to the I theta three. Yeah. Whatever. Theta, right? That will just change the phase here. So what I mean, well, there is U1, as Guillermo said, I can use U1. But even in SU2, I can do that. In which case, there is no U1 that, uh, so in other words, let me write like this, E to the I theta. This is, this is the correct statement I should have made. But I rate it for you guys. Now I made more transformation. I can still have phi zero going into e to the i theta t3 or 2 t3, theta over 2 t3 phi zero. Right? I can do that, t3. t3 is sigma 3 over 2. Two theta. And this makes it disappear, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this phase is not physical. Therefore, the web of sigma in this, or sigma dagger is the same, is just V times unit. It's not phi dagger that gets a web, okay? That's the definition of charge, if you want. There is this question that we faced today earlier. Am I really making sure the charge is not broken? Yes, I am. Because that direction, which is unbroken, I call neutral, okay? Mm -hmm. I cannot put the web here anymore. I've already decided <coughs> that. So, so that means that sigma zero, this is what I want to tell you, it breaks. So this symmetry, SU2L, plus SU2R, is now broken. This is not invariant under this transformation. UL is different from UR in general. Mm -hmm. I broke the SO4. And you know how you broke it to SO3. Mm -hmm. In this language, what, what remains? Or in this formalism, mm -hmm. with this notation, what remains only is the piece when left is equal to right. We call that vector line.
only the piece less than equal to one, which is SU2. Inside SU2 and SU2, there are various subgroups. One is SU2. Or if you wish, UL has generators I can call TAL. UR has generators TAR. And I can find the linear combinations, the sum, the difference, and so on. In this case, only the sum matters, okay? In other words, this breaks down into SU2, left plus right. Because this is invariant, okay? Sigma zero transforms into UL, sigma zero UR dagger. This is equal to sigma zero only when UL is equal to UR. So I, in a just different formalism, I've proven this, that SU2L plus SU2R broke into SU2L plus R. But you see the gauge bosons were a triplet under this. So they are triplet under this also. They don't care about SU2R. It's basically the same thing for them. See, I needed to identify a protective symmetry that keeps the gauge boson massive. So I should see how the gauge boson transform under that symmetry. So this particular notation is more useful to see how the gauge field transforms. The SO3 one was not so useful. Well, you can do that algebra also. It will take some work. It will take some, you know, changing the, the basis, okay. This particular thing is called a bidoublet. I can always form a bidoublet, doublet and phi tilde, okay. And these are very important representations in groups like SU2L cross SU2R. For example, suppose that one day you say, I want to gauge SU2R. Doesn't, doesn't it make you feel like you should gauge SU2R? Mm -hmm. It's just me. What does it mean? What I mean? Um, I mean, what is the standard model? Look at the standard model. And then you are the R. About it, we... Doesn't it bug you? It looks like a cripple, you know, when I give... <laughs> <laughs> when, I give big, when I give big colloquia or popular lectures, I said, you know, I can accept that God is left-handed. I can't accept that she's an invalid. Okay, this is an invalid, okay? <laughs> well, it could be. I don't, I, well, I didn't, I wish I had come up with an idea. I don't know if I would have ever, but I was just studying my graduate school when I found out that, that Pati and Salam suggested something along the line. It was worked out by Pati and Mohapat, but they didn't take it so seriously. I fell in love with this. The idea that they had, the world would be much nicer if it looked like this. Mm. Well, that means there must be another SU2R, because this is not the way it looks, okay? These guys don't have weak interactions. So what's the thing? Well, according to this picture, if there is left, there is right. Mm. So if there is a triplet of, of gauge fields, call them WR. That means that there is a triplet of gauge bosons WR. <coughs> they are there, but they are just heavier. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you should see it tomorrow, then let's see. I keep making bets. I'm going to lose a lot of money by the end of the run of this year. A lot of money if they don't find it. I'm going to be mm -hmm. bloody angry. <laughs> Making a lot of ends. That, that not only that, I'm betting that a particular way of breaking that uh -huh. I've been developing. I'm making a really dangerous bet. Okay. <laughs> but you know, in English you say, put your money where your mouth is. If you take yourself seriously, you put your money where your mouth is. Okay. Anyway. All I meant here is that, mm -hmm. according to this picture, you would take this U1 and you will enlarge it in SU2R. And then everything would be completely <coughs> symmetric. I'll have to say a few words about the theory. It will end up necessary. By the way, w what was so special about the theory? Why did some people pursue it? and then many others follow. Because if I really want the world to be symmetric, notice, then there must be a new R. So the prediction that we made was that the neutrino is massive. 
which in the 70s many people told me I was wasting my time. I got obsessed with the three numbers, okay. I'm, I'm very glad that I followed this, okay. We came up with the prediction of the three numbers. The theory says not to build a model that I can always do a posteriori. The theory predicted it from the beginning. So I'll have to say a few words. But that comes later. Okay. So I don't want you to really learn this. For lovers of group theory and people that want to go deeper, this lecture may be used. I don't necessarily expect you. This is a non-trivial material, a bit tough. I hope you have followed it, but I can pause still for a few. A few. Uh, we are about to finish anyway for two minutes. Remember in this notation, instead of SO4, I talk of SU12 cross SU2R. This is SU12 cross SU2R, obviously which is broken down by sigma zero. Into a vector subgroup that we call it. one when they are, call it left plus right. One which is symmetric on the left and right. When you isolate just the, say the sum of the generators, they are symmetric on the left and right. The real difference wouldn't be. By the way, I, I should wrap it up. Uh, um, I think it's important to say it, so bear with me another few minutes. And there we go. This is not to be learned here, this is just to relax and hear a few words. Mm -hmm. that Take an up and down quark. Imagine that there is only up and down quark. If m up is equal m down, you would have a symmetry, which we call, we have a name for the symmetry. Isospin symmetry, right? <coughs> it's a famous SU2 isospin symmetry. Imagine that m up is equal m down, is equal zero. The Lagrangian would look like this. I could write it I, QL bar gamma mu d mu QL, plus I, QR bar gamma mu d mu QR. I'm just thinking of kinetic energy. Forget for the moment the interactions. Mm -hmm. And what else? Q, of course, is UD. Mm -hmm. It has more symmetry than SU2. What is it? Changes to left to right? No, mass term changes left to right, not kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. Kinetic energy, remember, is symmetric. It's left, left, and mm -hmm. it just tells you that the left handed particle stays left handed, of course, it's just running somewhere. Uh, is it right? This case, right. SU2L, well, symmetry separately. I can separately rotate. Left-handed quarks or right-handed quarks. When the mass is zero, they don't know about each other. They don't talk to each other. They just propagate on their own. So this is actually the, in the world in which quark mass is zero. And by quarks, I just mean the light quarks. I mean the quarks that make up this world, OK? <coughs> now imagine that the symmetry is broken spontaneously. This is a global symmetry. This is not gauged. I'm not gauging it. This is it. I'm not talking about weak interactions here or anything. Just looking at the mass matrix of the quark. Imagine that this global symmetry is broken down spontaneously. Even before understanding the mechanism of strong interaction, which is QCD, which whatever can happen, okay? Number imagine, in 1960, that maybe 
this global symmetry is broken, you know, it could be quark, anti-quark, condensate, something is breaking it, I don't know what, into the symmetry, because this is not the symmetry of the world. The only symmetry we see in the world is this vector-like symmetry, isospin, how did I call it, isospin. What would happen in this world if this were to take place? Spontaneously breaking it. I will get... Ghosts and bosons. How many I will get? Three number ghosts and bosons. Three. 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 Minus three okay. is three. Uh, then he said, but look, he says pions, there are three pions and they are very light. So now he said, I think they are ghosts and bosons, okay? It sounds crazy. Well, but they are not massless, you tell him. Well, he says, it's true that they are not massless, but that's because quark mass is not zero. Mm -hmm. If the quark mass were zero, Nambu says, there would be Goldstone boson. So Nambu says, I expect that the mass of the pion squared is mass of the quark, something on the line, times some scale responsible for symmetry break. We call it the scale of chiral symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. okay. Today you know what that scale would be, that's the only scale in the world. It could be dynamics mm. of strong interactions, there is no other scale there, <coughs> which is the scale of QCD, around GV roughly, I don't know. So, this crazy idea, he was full of such crazy idea, is the cornerstone of modern particle physics actually. Pions do behave like that. This works beautifully because this is a small number. Moreover, you know how Goldstone bosons couple through this axial and this work beautifully with pions. You know, people like Weinberg and many others proved this, studied scattering of pions and so on using this Goldstone picture. Okay. So the idea of this SU2 cross SU2 symmetry is useful to uh, to master it, those of you interested, okay? So I suggest you an exercise for those of you who are going to show that SU4 is equal to SU2 plus SU2. Just look up the generators of SO4, right, and you form the inner combinations. You just take three that commute with the other three. It's not a big deal. Remember the generators of SO group. SO group is like Lorentz similar. Not exactly. It goes delta i k, no? Mm -hmm. Delta i j l minus, okay, let me not write it, I'm going to stop at this point, okay, I just wanted to tell you, okay, this was, this was sort of a, uh, an edit material. Okay. Let me see if there is some global question and then we can pause and have <laughs> some okay. informal if, if such things exist. That's okay. I can press this button.